Hello guys, this is Dr. Emmanuel Wogu. I want us to have a very quick um, discussion on autism spectrum disorder. I know autism is something that many of us would have heard about, uh, but I know a couple of people might be wondering what exactly does autism entail. So we'll just go through these few slides just to improve our understanding of what autism spectrum disorder actually entails. So ASD or autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it's a problem that, that actually affects our brain, the functioning of our brain and the development of our brain function. So it's a neurodevelopmental disorder that is characterized by impairments in social communication and interaction. Along with, along with restricted repetitive behavior. So what it means is there is a spectrum. So a person who has ASD autism and can present in a myriad of ways, in several ways, ranging from behaviors that lie or that fit within a spectrum or that fit within a range, which means everyone with autism would not necessarily have the same challenges or the same you know, clinical presentation. But typically the things we find are that a person who has autism might have problems with their communication. So they might be very shy, they might have restricted vocabulary, they might struggle with communicating and interacting you know, socially. They might have repetitive behaviors, you know, a very short or restricted range of activities. So you might notice that someone that has autism might be doing almost the same thing all the time. Um, now what are those factors or those things that increase you know a person's risk of developing autism so if it varies it's, of course autism can happen randomly or sporadically which means anyone can you know can actually have autism but there are some things that increase your risk like having a family history so a family member who has had autism or other neurodevelopmental challenges or problems could increase a person's risk of having autism and of course um, advanced parental age you know um can also play a role. There has been some speculations in the past and even presently about people wondering if some vaccines such as the MMR vaccine or even some vaccines, people believe that, you know, the growing, you know, global need for prevention of, you know, communicable diseases by vaccination can increase the risk of vaccine of, of autism in children. However, there has not been any proven studies to back those, to back those um, speculations. So when it comes to autism, autism can be associated with other conditions. So if someone has autism, it could be, or you might find that uh, that person might also have some other neurodevelopmental you know, problems like ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So in ADHD, typically you notice, as the name suggests, you notice that the person would have a problem with inattention. They struggle to concentrate on something that easily distracted um, and usually yeah, if it comes to hyperactivity, then the person is just posterior, just all, all over the place, uh, still struggles to sit in a place, struggles to stay calm, struggles to remain on one activity for, for a reasonable length of time, easily distracted and hyperactive. So ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder, can coexist with tic disorders, you know. Um, tic, so tic simply means those involuntary movements. Um, it's a kind of involuntary um, you know, uh, usually motor, what we call movements. It's coming kind of movement, so these people might be having some jerky kind of movement. You might see someone's neck jerking. Sometimes it might not even be movement ticks, it can be vocal ticks. So people might just be saying things randomly, especially, you know, things that they don't intend to say. So it can be vocal ticks as well. They can have other abnormal motor abnormalities. Motor simply means movement problems or muscle problems. They could they have increased risk of having epilepsy, which is a seizure disorder. Uh, they might have some gastrointestinal problems and obviously a risk of um, psychiatric conditions, depression, anxiety, and even schizophrenia. So people with autism can at increased risk of having mental health problems as well, uh, which we can see here. So anxiety, depression, um, other psychiatric conditions, so called comorbidities. Now, we might have touched this, but we we'll still have to repeat it. So diagnostic features of autism spectrum disorder. So the DSM-5 criteria, DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, which is usually used like a, it's like a, you know, a Bible for diagnosing um, mental health conditions. Um, so as we said previously, 
There could be deficits in, co in social communication and interaction, restricted, repetitive behaviors um, or interests. You know, um, so examples of such deficits impaired social and emotional reciprocity. So you might notice that someone with autism struggles to actually show appreciation, struggles to interpret people's emotions, struggles to express their emotions. They might love you, but they might struggle to express that love. They might be angry and they might struggle to express their emotion or they have inappropriate ways of expressing their thoughts and their emotions. Um, they might have non-verbal communication, so they might have impaired non-verbal communication. Um, and they might also have struggles forming relationships. They might, you know, tend to keep to themselves because they struggle in terms of, you know, emotional connection and forming relationships. They might have restricted repetitive behaviors, as we said. So stereotypes, they might have stereotype movements, you know, always doing the repeated things, you're tapping their legs, you know, they're tapping their feet or just doing repetitive body movements. Um, flexibility, um, have intense focus on narrow interests so the person might just it's just like it's very similar the interests span will just be very narrow they just probably keep doing the same thing over and over and they might have some sensory abnormalities so sensory abnormalities typically how patients or parents would describe sensory abnormalities is a child struggles to really process sensations it can be sound it can be visual things they see it can be what things you tell them you know their reaction to the things they feel they hear the things they see they might be having some inappropriate or unusual unexpected reactions to those things for instance a child could could go through a tantrum um, when you do something that you don't expect them to you know to have a tantrum from in terms of evaluation and diagnosis so the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder requires a comprehensive assessment so usually we'll have a structured interview, which is, you know, of course, where we get our history. We take information from the child. The child is old enough. Uh, we try to gather information from the caregiver or the parents, uh, from the school. We try to get information from the school. How is the child coping at school, you know, in terms of their behavior. Um, so also do a behavioral ob observation during the consultation as a GP. Usually we don't have a lot of time to spend with our patients most times 10, 15 minutes. And I must say that that's not a long enough time to assess for suspected autism spectrum disorder. But during that 10 minutes, so you just, as you're speaking with the parents or the caregiver, um, usually we observe the child, we try to in interact with the child and observe the child's behavior um, during that short consultation. That usually gives us a clue as to whether something could be wrong or not. And if we think, obviously, based on this interaction, we then we can then refer for proper um, autism spectrum disorder assessment, where they, the specialists would then spend more time with these children and observe them. So cognitive assessment, we usually do a cognitive assessment and medical examination. We might do an ECG, which is a tracing of the heart to make sure they haven't got any congenital heart problems. Um, and then we might need to start considering genetic testing if we think maybe there could be a genetic um, correlation, something that might be found, a family history, or we suspect the child might have some um, hereditary or congenital problems. We may need to start considering neuroimaging, so MRI scans of the brain to see if you know any, if there's any brain abnormality, any structural uh, brain abnormalities that could be found. Metabolic profile profiling based on clinical presentation. So based on how the child presents, you might need to consider if you want to ask yourself the child hypothyroid has the child got Cushing syndrome has the child got something metabolic or endocrine I might need to be referring of course to the pediatricians who would then consider doing those tests so these are the kind of things that we do as doctors when we suspect a child could have autism um, and just to mention as well this ASD is a spectrum now so it involves other um, things like um, Asperger's, Asperger's disease, Asperger's syndrome, you know, so it's now a spectrum. Most of all those conditions have now been lumped into ASD, autism spectrum disorder. So screen, so in terms of screening, obviously we don't go about screening every child. Usually we only begin to think about screening or consider ASD as a diagnosis when 
the parents are concerned or the caregivers or school is concerned the school teachers or other people are concerned health this is all as we begin to we don't just start screening there's no standard screening test for like for every child or for every person for asd but usually it's good we encourage people to bring up suspicious behaviors or interactions as early as possible so we begin to look into it and see if we need to be uh, intervening early to help the child and the family Screening is important for early detection and intervention. So in terms of management goals for ASD, autism spectrum disorder, the goal is to increase functional independence and quality of life. And let me just say here, sometimes there is, some people could be autistic because it's a spectrum. Some people could have mild, you know, moderate, severe forms of these, um, you know, autism. And um, Sometimes autism could also be associated with intellectual deficits. And sometimes when it's associated with intellectual deficits or a significant social interaction problem, that's when we usually pick it up. Some people could go, could grow up with, with, with undiagnosed autism. Maybe when they now become adults and they begin to have some struggles with their relationship, they begin to, and with increasing awareness of how autism presents, people might now, you might now start seeing, we're seeing an increasing number of adults young adults in their 30s 40s people in middle age who are coming to say oh yeah i think i suspect i might be autistic and they might want to be referred for that proper assessment um, and they might have done some questionnaires online as well and they're ticking the boxes for suspected autism so we're seeing an increasing number of adults young and middle aged who believe they might be autistic and maybe they were not diagnosed in childhood and we're also attending and trying to help them so as we can see the goal is to increase functional independence and quality of life um, non-pharmacologic interventions non-pharmacologic means interventions that don't involve prescribing medications for patients so like parent mediated interventions where the parents begin to pay more attention to the child begin to find out how well how best they can help this child navigate you know improve their social interactions and also expand their range of interests so therapies delivered interventions is where we now refer the child to a mental health, you know, uh, a mental health um, therapist, psychologist that will actually help them. Um, massage therapy, exercise, you know, general eating healthy, um, you know, if there is any stress, stress strenuous, you know, events at home, we try to manage that as well. I need to consider referring, you know, the, referring that child or family to social services. You would think that there's a social problem that might be increasing um, the child's problems. Now, in terms of medications, medications may help manage behavioral problems. So if the child is too is agitated, for instance, there might need to be some tranquilizers or, you know, some mild sedatives to help the child is having problems with sleep. We might need to give some medications that will help with their sleep. If the child is having depressive, you know, like depression, then it's obviously the children's uh, psychologist or psychiatrist usually prescribe, um, consider prescribing some antidepressants for that child. And obviously, if the child is having psychotic features, then they might also need to prescribe some antipsychotic medications uh, to help that individual as well. As we've said, antipsychotics like risperidon and riprazol can reduce aggression and self-injury in children and young persons that have a autism spectrum disorder. Antidepressants, typically the SSRIs, you know, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, may improve symptoms in adults. Evidence in children is lacking even though it can be used actually so in terms of management of associated conditions um, if a child is has adhd that can be managed with stimulant medications you know like methylphenidate, finidate uh, atomozactine these are medications that can be used in the treatment or management of um, attention hyper attention deficits hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder so let's bring this to a close. Um, autism spectrum disorder requires early recognition because of the impact it can have in a child's development, social development, especially, um, and even language development. So we need to identify it, make this diagnosis early and initiate interventions as early as possible. And it has to be an individualized management because it presents differently and everybody will have different challenges or every different limitations. So we'll try to channel the treatment or, or the management to meet that person's uh, specific needs. 
a multidisciplinary approach usually you know involving healthcare providers educators you know the teachers uh, families essential for optimal outcomes and there's something called high high functioning autism um just to mention before we wrap this up so high functioning autism as i said you know autism can also come with some mental some in some learning some learning disability or some learning difficulties which previously used to be called mental retardation or learning difficulties which is also a spectrum um you know and uh, there are some people who have who don't have learning difficulties so usually they, they are classified as high functioning um high functioning autism spectrum disorder where the person has you know the typical um, language restriction interaction restricted you know limited uh, spectrum of limited scope of of, of interests uh, and and behaviors but the person still has a normal um, normal iq normal intellect per se so uh, just for you to be aware that there's a terminology like that so we've come to the end of this tete a tete on autism spectrum disorder I hope it was useful. I hope you've learned something, uh, even if you're very vast in, in the topic of ASD. I hope you um, you found it engaging as well. Thanks for watching and listening.